So I'd like to welcome you to Hold It Right There, How People and Pottery Interact. And so I'd like to share a little bit about um, <clears throat> uh, how I feel about this upcoming presentation and the presenter. Um, at my first in Sika, like many of you, mine was in uh, Tampa, and I actually found it uh, really revealing how sort of separated from the ceramics community I felt and how cold um, one can feel when you're sort of walking into an establishment of thousands of people and you don't know anyone. Um, I really had no idea what to do, and I found this room where people were standing outside and sort of peeking their heads, almost like a rock concert, to see what was going on. And then I looked in there, and <clears throat> it was sort of this series of uh, a, a really scholarly discourse on pottery. At that particular time, it was a discussion on the cup. And I never thought that someone thought about the cup so much and what it does to different people from different places in the world. Um, and thinking about it so intensely that it actually became humorous as to how obsessed we are with the things that we make. The other thing that I found, though, was that immediately when I walked in that room, it kind of felt like when you go home for Christmas and you see your parents. It is a room for the brothers and sisters. And it takes pioneers and clay to really bring those people together and figure out the right language and set the right precedent for those sort of discussions to happen. Pete Pinnell is one of those people. Pete has a BA in music from Columbia College, a BFA from Alfred, an MFA from the University of Colorado Boulder, and he was a full-time potter for eight years while teaching at my alma mater, Kansas City Art Institute, and Johnson County Community College. He has taught at the University of Nebraska since 1995, and he'll be stepping down as the chair on July 1st to return to teaching and, most importantly, making pots. It is with the utmost pleasure that I get to introduce Mr. Pete Pinnell today. Thank you, it's great to be here. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone associated with NSICA. It's such an astounding organization, and so many people put in so much time and do such a great job. So before I go ahead, I, I hope we could just acknowledge everyone who does, makes this all possible. And I'm going to start with, um, well, this first slide. Um, I want to talk about why cultures change. By, by the way, I, I, I thought it was great that Robert introduced me because I thought he could wake you up before I put you back to sleep with his very dry academic. Um, Ernst Gombrich, who is an Austrian-born English art historian, wrote about the psychology of change. And he said, there's always a pressure to retain the status quo. And there's really only a few things that can cause a culture to change. One of them is times of upheaval, like famine or war. Changes in religion will definitely change daily practice. And changes in fashion over time can change the way people live. So we're going to talk about functional pots here. And by the way, I, I'm using a rather broad definition of pottery. I'm not limiting it just to objects made out of clay or ceramic materials. Uh, so you're going to see things made out of metal or glass or leather or other materials. But I'm kind of lumping. If it serves that purpose, I'm calling it pottery for this. Uh, but we're going to talk about functional pottery. And I thought before we started, since this is functional pottery, we should talk about what functional means. So. This says, can I read it on my notes over here? This is from the Oxford English Dictionary. It turns out there's more than 10 different definitions to function, and almost none of them have anything to do with the way we use the word. Um, one C kind of helps, is related to the arts, especially to architecture, designating work connected with a view to its utilitarian purpose. I'm not sure exactly what that says, but it, it kind of sounds like what we do. 2D kind of nails it on the head, pertaining to or serving a function. <laughs> but, okay, and more clearly, the opposite of functionless, okay. Um, but then it gives us a clue, also practical or utilitarian. Okay, utility. 
Ah, the fact, character, or quality of being useful or serviceable, fitness for some desirable purpose or valuable end, usefulness, serviceableness. Okay, I like that. Oh, those are all, they're great sounding things. Useful or serviceable, sure. Uh, fitness for some desirable purpose, I like that. Valuable end, that's all really good. What that did was just describe this. <laughs> By the way, I have to have a tip of the hat to the Kohler company because they have supported ceramics and the art so very much. This isn't just any toilet. This is a Kohler Cimarron Comfort Height elongated 1.2 gallon per flush toilet with aqua piston technology. That is utilitarian. So what else? There must be some other reason, right, that we make these things. Well, it turns out that what we are interested in, besides utility, is expression, right? We want to express ideas and emotions, communication. We would definitely like to communicate with the viewer uh, visually, tactily, experientially. Exploration. I don't know any of us who aren't interested in exploring, don't in fact want to spend a lifetime exploring. Experience, the experience of the viewer that, that the object creates for the viewer. And certainly, last but not least, we haven't tended to say this word, but beauty. Most of us are interested in beauty, both the beauty of the object itself and the beauty of the experience that we can create for the viewer, okay? So there's a lot that we're interested in beyond utility, but we're all interested in utility. So this is probably a better model than that Kohler model for what we're talking about here. Uh, this is a tea bowl in the Raku style. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a Raku tea bowl in the Panchong style, Korean Panchong style from Japan from the late 18th century. So that's utilitarian, but obviously a whole lot more. Which leads us to this thought with pottery. Utili utility is the vehicle not the destination. With that toilet, utility was the destination. That's what it was about, right? It serves a, uh, a valuable end, as it were. But we're interested in using utility to carry all of those other ideas that I just talked about. Now, I'm going to go off on a tangent to talk a little bit about ideas and how, about how ideas can change over time. This is Alexander the Greek. Uh, Alexander the Great, who left Greece in 334 BC to conquer the world. And in particular, he wanted to defeat Darius III, king of the Persian Empire. He had with him a force of 48,100 soldiers, 6,100 cavalrymen, a fleet of 120 ships, and 38,000 sailors. He meant business. So you can see where he circulated, starting up there in Macedonia. Macedonia. There's a little place there was uh, in both Greece and then in what's now Syria. He fought, or uh, Turkey and then Syria, he fought major battles, went, went on to conquer the Levant, Egypt, and then turned back around and went out into Central Asia. Along the way, he left Greek culture everywhere he went and he founded cities that were staffed with Greeks and who brought Greek um, uh, uh, habits with them. This, by the way, is Alexander the, the Great uh, translated into Egyptian hieroglyphics. So one of the things he brought with him is this way of formal dining, right? This is the symposium in Greece. This is from about 100 years before Alexander, and these men are, are at a symposium. They are laying down on top of the table. So we always think of eating as you have a table, you sit in a chair, and you face the table. That's not the way they ate. They, laid, they had tables, but they lay down on top of the tables. And this was very commonplace. And it spread actually wherever Greek culture went, even before Alexander. So here, this is from Italy. This is a tomb painting of men laying on tables and eating and playing a game, by the way, uh, where they toss the wine leaves into a central kind of a spittoon. 
Uh, this took place in a, a room called a triclinium where people sat in a three-sided way like this. Uh, this is a drawing of when you have more guests in a tri and That was a small triclinium, that first one. Here's a larger one and you can see how everyone lay down on their left elbow on pillows and ate. And so it, but it's not as if people didn't have chairs. This is from long before that, 2800 BC. This is a, a harp player uh, or a, a statue of a harp player from Egypt. This is a, a scroll, uh, a, um, uh, a cylinder seal off on the left. And when you rolled it onto clay, you can see the scene it does. Again, that's from about 2600 BC. And you can see people sitting in chairs and eating and drinking. But they're not sitting at a table, right? They're just sitting in chairs. And chairs were very common. I mean, here's a, a painting from a, from a tomb in Egypt of a chair maker. So that's his drill and he's drilling a hole where he's gonna connect the arm, which is off to the right. Uh, just to show that life never changes really, this is a line of men waiting to get a haircut. <laughs> Those are two barbers down at the bottom and some of them are sitting on the ground and some are sitting on stools. So the chair's been around a long time, the table's been around a long time as well. Again, she's playing a game. This is uh, Nefertiti, and she's playing the game of Senate. So they had tables and chairs, and they put them together. They just didn't eat on them. Here's another example of that, playing Senate. This is how they ate, right? Laying down on the left side. So this is from th this uh, uh, particular uh, mosaic was found in Israel. And they're laying on their left side. You can see uh, this is from the Roman era. And the Roman habit was to have a boiler off on the right where they could have hot water during the meal. And there's then two other servants and three people eating. This went everywhere the Romans went. This is from a tomb in England. So this is the way we think of the Last Supper, isn't it? Right? The, the way Leonardo painted it. But actually, up until then, up until the table and the chair began to be used that way, the Last Supper looked like this in artwork. This is from 600 AD from Ravenna, Italy, right? In the form of a triclinium. And by the way, yes, they actually did manage to cram 12 apostles and Jesus into this one little space. One of them is kind of tucked in like they sort of realized they counted wrong at first. And, <laughs> and here's uh, all, all these glum-faced apostles. This is from 1100 AD. And again, in arranged in a triclinium. Uh, that's Judas reaching early for the food. <laughs> Judas has always been a problem. <laughs> but in Northern Europe, the table started to take on other uses early on. So this is from just 100 AD. So it's, this is from a tomb in Germany. And you can see that the men who are eating are laying down on their left side behind there. There are three people eating, but there are two servants sitting in front of them in chairs holding the food. And by the Middle Ages, the table and chairs as a place for eating, as a way of eating, were well established throughout Europe. Uh, so this is from uh, a painting by, a series of paintings by Pietro Lorenzetti called um, 11 Scenes from the Life of Holy Humility. So even when you're living in humility, you still get to eat at a table and chair. And this is one of those cases where it's changes of fashion and I have my own theory about that. It was the wealthy, the aristocracy, uh, the royalty, the people in religious orders who first started eating at tables and chairs in Europe. And my theory is those are the people who had stone floors. And if you imagine a stone floor in Europe in the winter time, I think you could look, really be looking for excuses to not lay down on the floor. Um, that didn't happen in the rest of the world. 
And so there are countless examples of people who like this, who this is a, a drawing, Shah Abbas and the cupbearer from 1638. Now Shah Abbas was a very wealthy and powerful military leader. He's gone on a picnic. They brought with him all kinds of drinks and food that's there in front of him, but he's happy to sit on a blanket on the ground. Or this from about the same time, Jangahir and the Cats from Mughal, India, 1630. And you can't tell me this man doesn't own a table or a chair, but he's perfectly happy to sit on a whole bunch of pillows. Or this from China. This is a landscape tea sipping under willows from 1644. Here's a close-up. They brought plenty of things on the picnic, but they didn't bother to bring chairs or, or even folding stools, which, by the way, they had at that time. Or this Islamic painting of women. Now, what, what's in this painting, what's kind of hard to see if you didn't know this, is they're on a low platform, and that very commonly happens everywhere on earth where people sit on the floor to eat. And so it raises you above a, a colder floor and makes it more comfortable. And it seems a bit more formal, okay? This is from the 17th century. Or this is 19th century Japan. It's an etching, a hand-colored etching of a family eating together. This is from the 18th century Japan. It's a woodblock portrait uh, from the Edo period, about 1770. So it's worth pointing out that hunter-gatherer humans, of course, ate on the floor. When humans moved indoors, they, or ate on the, the ground. When humans moved indoors, they continued to eat on the ground until they had floors, and then they ate on the floors. And when they wanted to be more comfortable, they added carpets and pillows and all the rest, and they continued to eat sitting on the floor. So it takes something some kind of change before people adapt other habits. Now this is China from the um, Northern Song Dynasty. So this is relatively early, about 11th AD. And there's a close up. So these men are eating dinner. So it turns out during the Tang Dynasty, they started bringing in uh, sort of a camp stool type chair from Central Asia were, were brought into China and they were popular. They were called foreign seats. Right? And then they became, became adapted and adopted into Chinese culture. So here, in the beginning of the Song Dynasty, you can see this very formal picnic going on out in the country. These are servants down at the bottom. And I would love to know what those big piles of brightly colored food are. They look really tasty. So let's go back to Gombrich's three points. Why do cultures change? Time of upheaval. Alexander the Great comes through and you'd rather just do what he does instead of being killed, so that's a very good reason. Um, changes in religion, that's certainly part of it, and changes in fashion, okay? But I wanna go back to Europe again and revisit the table. And I want you to look in what's on here. So this is um, Christ in the house of Simon and the Pharisees, painted in the 1440s, you can see Mary Magdalene in the lower left, she's just finished washing and anointing Jesus' feet and she's drying them with her hair. And these four men are getting ready to eat. And here's their dinner table. There's two knives, two glasses, two mugs of some sort, and two serving plates with fish on them. They're having fish for lunch and a scattering of pieces of bread. And what you'll notice there is they're not organized in front of any one person. And that's because for a very long time in Europe, what was brought to the table was the food. And then everyone helped themselves from central platters. And if you needed a knife, you pulled out your knife, right? Everyone carried, everyone carried a knife. Nuns carried knives, right? You need a knife, you pull it out. You can cut off a piece of food. Uh, if you want a piece of bread, you grab a piece of bread off the table. If you want a drink, you grab whatever one is nearest to you that has the drink in it that you want to have, whether it's the wine or the beer or the cider or whatever. Uh, so this is a very formal setting. John, Duke of Berry, enjoying a grand meal. So the Duke, there in blue towards the right, this is a, a uh, uh, detail of the painting. 
Uh, and again, that, that big chicken-shaped thing on the right is just a salt cellar. That's just for serving salt, okay? This is a formal dinner. They're having Cornish game hens. You can see piles of them. But it's only the carver there in front with the knife who has any kind of utensil at all. Everyone else is going to eat with their hands and eat from whatever happens to be in front of them. I'm going to point out that the, the head servants have this rather odd um, thing hanging. I just can't point. The guy in blue, if you look about three quarters of the way down on the left, and the guy in green. As fashions go, that's one I would suggest that you don't adapt. I don't know when. <laughs> So this is a Mannerist altarpiece from between 1515 and 1520 from the Netherlands. And again, it's Bible stories, and you can home in. And here, they have these wonderful little uh, kind of minimalist pewter squares that seem to be functioning as plates that I think are fascinating. Uh, you can see a little salt cellar off to the left. Uh, so, uh, there's a glass. There are two glasses on the table that I can see, and one knife, right? So it's not as if eating implements have not been around. This is a spoon from third century AD Rome. This is a very unique vessel that was from Rome, uh, eating utensil, a combination of a spoon and a fork, except in this case, the fork wasn't for eating. It was for reaching out to the middle of the table and being able to spear something tasty and bring it back to you. Right. It was the, in what's now uh, Iran and that where the fork was first introduced. Uh, this is a set of two Sasanian forks from about the 6th and 7th century AD. Uh, these are Persian forks from just about 100 years later. These were made out of bronze. You can see the design wasn't exactly as we use for forks today. This is the woman who tried to introduce the fork then into uh, Europe. She was a Byzantine princess who was born in 1955, or 19, no, 955. <laughs> they just barely got here. 955, Theophano. At the age of 17, she was married off to Otto II, the son of the Holy Roman, Roman Emperor, and she went to Venice and she appalled them. Uh, they, uh, writers at the time quoted, hey, she used a golden double prong to bring food to her mouth. They just could not understand that. Um, normally, again, people would have used their hands. The other thing about her that truly appalled them is she bathed every day. So they just, they didn't understand that at all. It didn't really stick. It didn't stay around Italy yet, and part of it was people have this association with the fork at that time. Fork, the fork was what the devil used, right? So why would you want to eat with that? It wasn't until a change in fashion, the introduction of pasta, a few centuries later, and the fork makes it easy to eat pasta. Because as Vermeer demonstrates here, it's hard to eat pasta without a fork. And I love this painting because the only implement he has is a knife. Okay, the next person who tried to spread the fork from beyond, then it, it spread into Italy. It wasn't used by all classes, but by some people. Uh, this is Catherine de' Medici. In uh, 1533, she went to uh, France, married Henry, the second son of uh, King Francis I and she brought forks with her. And again, people were amazed and appalled by these things. Uh, this is a painting, a wonderful painting uh, by Paolo Veronese. This is from, done between 1562 and 63, and it's just, it's a huge painting with a wealth of details. And it is set during his time. So this was, for him, he's, it's, it's uh, a, a, the story of the wedding feast at Cana, so you see Jesus in the middle of the painting, but everybody's dressed and the settings as if they were in his time. And if you look off to the left here, you can get a really nice view of the table. And again, there are no implements. 
So even as formal a feast as this in that time, if you wanted to eat with something, you brought it with you, right? Except if you look in the far back there, there's that woman eating with a fork. So she was very stylish. She brought her own fork with her. And one other place in the painting, you can't really see it, but this man is doing that very characteristic thing we do with holding the food with the fork and cutting it with his knife as he looks off to his left and talks to somebody else. So even at that time, uh, 30 years after uh, Catherine de' Medici left Italy, in Italy there still are only a few people using a fork. But they became fashionable, and they became fashionable fairly quickly. And then people started to have forks and to bring them with them. So here's a very special fork from Germany. That's a glass fitting on the right that went over the fork so you could also use it like a spoon. Or this, that's actually a rock crystal handle on a gold fork. So as these things became more fashionable, people had their own sets made and they carried them with them to find dinners. And then it became a social statement such as this. And by the way, spoons, a spoon wasn't something you put in your mouth. The spoon was a way of holding the food to your mouth and then you drank from the edge of it, the way you would drink from the edge of a bowl. But here's spoons with a fork and knife. Or here's another set, a traveling set with a case to carry it all together, including a very nice toothpick, because when you pick your teeth at the end of the meal, you also want to do that in a stylish way. <laughs> or this is a knife, I think this is quite beautiful, from Germany, with coral used as the handles, gold inlay on it. Now, the man who tried to introduce the fork to England, and believe me, the English having nothing of it in 1611 was Thomas Coriat. So he went on a long multi-year tour of Europe and then wrote a very funny book about it, about all the things that had happened along the way, Coriat's Crudities. And you'll, among other things, there's a picture on there of a woman vomiting on his head and he had running away from someone chasing him with a pitchfork and on and on. Um, he was given, and he brought forks back with him and used them everywhere he went. And he was given the nickname Fursifer, meaning fork bearer. And it was denounced in England as being effeminate, number one. Um, but also it was seen as uh, somewhat illicit, almost like uh, kind of naughty to do something like that. God gave you hands and that's the way you're supposed to eat. It really wasn't until the late 18th and early 19th century that the fork took on this modern, curved, multiple points so that it could be used both as a scoop and to poke it and then to put it in your mouth. Almost immediately then in the 19th century, the opposite happened. People started developing hundreds of different kinds of eating utensils to have at a well-appointed table. So these are very specialized, spoon fork combinations. These were made actually uh, in the New World in Boston in 1677. And it's for getting um, pickled things out of a jar and then being able to scoop up a little of the sweet drink, uh, juice that went with it to have. And so that you could eat, use these at a dinner party and be very elegant. Or this, anyone know what that is? It's a marrow spoon, that's right. So when you're at an elegant dinner party and they serve you bones, then you're going to need different sizes of spoons to pick the marrow out of the middle of the bone. So that's something we don't use a whole lot these days. So here's an example. This is a little scene from Downton Abbey, uh, where the, the, a new footman learns about the spoons. Go on then. Teaspoon, egg spoon, melon spoon, grapefruit spoon, Jam spoon. Shall I tell you? All right. A bouillon spoon. But I thought soup spoons were the same as tablespoons. Ah, so they are, but not for bouillon, which is drunk from a smaller dish. Off you go now. Right, so a whole long line of spoons. By the late 19th, early 20th century, it's almost like you couldn't have too many implements at the dining table. 
In fact, by the 20th century, we recognized these so much that Alexander Calder could make a sculpture of a knife, fork, and spoon. And we all know exactly what they are. So, why do cultures change? Time of upheaval, we've seen that. Right? Time, changes in religion, changes in fashion. All of that was due to changes in fashion, changes in food that occurred over a period of time. But I want to return to this image. And if you look closely, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but next to, a, if you look at the two gentlemen on the lower left-hand corner, just to the right of the one on the right, you can see a pair of chopsticks. And if you look closely scattered around that table are chopsticks. So the chopstick is a whole different thing. It first evolved, uh, they say it goes back at least 5,000 years, 3,000 BC. It was used in cooking. Um, by about uh, uh, 1200, it was ubiquitous by cooking. By, by 400 BC, it was also being used for eating. And it was in response to uh, calamitous things that happened. The people, uh, there wasn't enough fuel in China. So in order to be able to cook food efficiently and quickly, the food was cut up into bite sizes before it was cooked. And since people were using chopsticks anyway to manipulate that in the kitchen, it got carried out onto the dining table. Then begin, combine that with Confucianism. Confucius thought that having a knife at the table, and when people have a knife at the table, they tend to spear food with it and use that to bring the, and, and he thought that spoke of violence and, and the killing of animals way too literally for a dinner table. So several things went together there. There was a change in fashion. Everyone started eating with chopsticks, but also there was a change, there, were, there was upheaval, right? The loss of fuel. And there was a change of religion. As, as Confucianism was adopted throughout East Asia, everywhere it went, the chopstick went with it. So that by 500 AD, everyone throughout China, Korea, and Japan were using chopsticks. So I want to think back. None of those things have any direct bearing on pottery, but all of them are practical and utilitarian, whether we're talking about tables or chairs or any of the rest of that. All have an aesthetic component, right? And all of these practices are inherently social. And it's, we can't overstate the importance of the social aspect of all of this. Because it's our social habits. These are women in, uh, taking tea on vacation in Loughton, Essex in 1908. And what these women are all doing, they've been, they have a cup of tea and a saucer. And they pour the tea into the saucer and then they're drinking from their saucers. So just because you have a table and chair doesn't mean you're going to eat at the table. And just because you have a saucer and cup doesn't mean you're going to drink from the cup. It has to do with the social things around you. Now I want to ask you a question. Now that you've seen all of these people reclining on tables and eating that way, how many of you actually thought, you know, I have pillows and I have a table. When I get home, Probably almost no one here actually is planning on Sunday night to lay down on top of their table and have dinner. And it's not the tool, it's the social, it's what you're used to doing, right? That's why it takes a little push to move us in new directions. Human beings love to intermingle the social, the aesthetic, and the utilitarian aspects of life. This is a perfectly functional outfit of clothing. I found this on Amazon. So is this. So is this. And so is this. They're all functional. Are they interchangeable? For the most part, no. Right? We wear, they're all, they all fill a function. Right? They're all utilitarian. But because of the social aspect of clothing, we tend to wear different clothing at different times and with different people and in different places. So there's a very strong parallel between pottery 
in clothing in that regard. So what does pottery do? Let's get on to pottery. It has core functions, eating, drinking, serving, pouring, preparing, cooking, storing. These are the things we kind of think of when we think about pottery. All of these have aesthetic capabilities. I mean, when you think about drinking, when you think about pouring, there is always an aesthetic component to that, and there's a practical component to that, and there is a social component to that. Then there are other functions, displaying a vase, right? Presenting. Uh, so we have Gromit here to remind us that even sitting alone, pouring tea is an elegant aesthetic act. So, but it has other functions as well. Ornament, it pottery ornaments and enlivens environments. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean. Uh, it engages with the environment and the viewer. It communicates, it expresses, and it is a signifier. These are very important things, and in some ways, they're the things that we tend to focus on. Again, going back to that idea about what's the vehicle and what's the destination. Oftentimes, we use utility to come to one of these other destinations. So, this is the em Emperor Qianlong. Uh, this is a painting of him in his study. Uh, there's a wonderful painter, I don't know if you've seen this guy's work, Giuseppe Castiglioni. He's an Italian painter who went to China and became a court painter to the emperor and was there for the rest of his life. And the style he painted in be grew into this wonderful combination of Italian style with Chinese style painting. But if you look in this image, you'll see that there is pottery. In fact, whenever you look at uh, images of a scholar's studio uh, in or study any time during Chinese history, you'll always see beautiful examples of pottery there. Uh, here's another scholar studio. This one's been taken from China, installed in a museum, and it's, it's a workplace, right? This is a place where a guy worked. But look on the table. He always wanted to have pottery there. Pottery in this situation was seen as an object of quiet contemplation. It was the thing you used to center yourself, to calm your nerves, to bring yourself back to the moment when your mind is frazzled, right? So is that a function? I would think so. So let's think about some of those other things I just listed. Engages with the viewer and the environment. This is a silver writing from Romania from the fourth century. Now it's missing some parts. You can see the eye is missing and the horn and the ear. But no one just picked up something like this because they were thirsty, right? If you're gonna drink about something like this, it's saying something about you, the viewer, and the environment. This is a very fun piece. Uh, talk about communicates. So this was made during the Sasanian period, probably about 300 AD in what's now Iran, from the reign of Shapur II. These were made to give as gifts to the leaders of surrounding countries. And it showed off the artistry of his culture and the high degree of skill of the craftsmen. And it was the portrait of Sharper himself uh, hunting wild boar with a bow and arrow, which was just sending the quiet little message. And by the way, our king is a badass, so don't even think about taking us on. Expresses. Well, many of you know this pot from the, from the Freer Sackler Museum. Uh, it's from about 1400 BC from Iran. You want to talk about pouring? That talks about pouring, right? That's taking pouring to an art form. You know whatever is poured out of that is the good stuff. It's a signifier. This is a Qing Dynasty vase from Jingdezhen, early 18th century. Having something like this in your home says something. That's ex precisely why these things were purchased and owned, is because they were beautiful. It's a signifier. But that's, I want to just extend that to give you an idea that signifiers can take all different forms and shapes. This is a piece of Eskimo art. 
from the early 20th century. So an Eskimo took red and blue yarn, now faded, and completely covered a standard metal tea kettle to make it something beautiful for day-to-day -day life. Isn't that wonderful? So, what's unique about pot? Again, it's a invitation for collaboration. I wanna go back to that. Let's think about that a second. The vase is the potter's way of saying, shall we dance? A vase can sit alone and empty, or a vase can, is, I can say, it's an invitation to the viewer to collaborate with the artist to finish the statement, to do something with them. The thing to remember about a vase is it's not necessarily practical, and it's certainly not essential, and yet vases have existed as long as there, have been, there has been human culture. This is from the pre-dynastic period. This is a vase from 4,000 BC in Egypt. At a time when there barely was culture, we were still thinking about how important it is to have an object like this in a home. This is much later, but I just happen to love this pot. It's a piece of 16th century Italian maiolica, and the maker was smart enough to fire it upside down, so all the glaze drips went to the tops of the handles. Isn't that brilliant? Sometimes it's the little things that separates ordinary from brilliant, right? Very different kind of vase. This is from Japan. Doesn't that look remarkably contemporary? It's from the Edo period, uh, about 1800. Or that, out of all the pieces of blue and white Chinese porcelain, this is about a 20-inch uh, tall vase. I think this one's remarkable for that very contemporary feel to it, even though that's from the Ming Dynasty, right? That's 500 years old. This is an Iznik pot from uh, uh, Turkey uh, from the 16th century. So the vase was everywhere culture was. Now this is just a reminder <laughs> that not everything that's useful is necessarily aesthetic. What makes pottery unique as an art form? The viewer's role isn't passive. The object and the viewer interact. That's very important. I've long joked with my students, there's hands behind you art, and there's hands in front of you art. There is an implied invitation for collaboration between the maker and the viewer. So the object is complete, but the viewer gets to go ahead and make it more complete. The object is changed by this interaction, and we understand that when we make the object, but we welcome that. That's very unique among art forms. And the last, and I think very important part of this is these actions take place within the context of the events and processes of life, both everyday life and the major milestones of life, because, again, these objects are social, as we talked about. So, this is a wonderful drawing from the Safavid period, uh, about six, uh, 1650, from Persia, and it's called Lovers Embracing. So you can see what's happening here. The man is behind her. He's grabbed this woman from behind and pulled her off her feet. She's reached back playfully and grabbed his hat and pulled it off his head, and is so kind of swept away in the moment that she doesn't notice that she's holding her wine cup upside down. And then there on the ground behind them, I've enlarged and put it on the right, are the, the wine vessel and his cup. And then you can see her cup above. I think this is a very important point to take, again, to, to state this. Our objects occur at, at, during life, right? That's where they have their role. That's where we use them. Now, how do we think about these? How do we ask ourselves questions to try to use this information usefully? And I'm thinking about this poem by Rudyard Kipling. I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. 
which leads us to some questions. Who is going to use this object I'm making? By the way, that, I'll go back a moment, that's an important consideration. Man, woman, child, king, peasant, who is it that's going to use this object? Second is, where are they going to use it? Even within our lives, we tend to have different objects for the kitchen, the breakfast nook, the dining room table, the living room, the bathroom, the bedroom, the entryway, the garden, the boardroom, the, entry, the lobby to a large building. Wherever location it is, we'll think about that object slightly differently. When will they use it? That could be time of day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, time of year, Passover, Christmas, Fourth of July. It could be time of life, coming of age ceremony, a wedding, a funeral. When something will be used is a very important part of design. How will they use it? Eating, drinking, serving? We talked about all those functions. What will they use it for? What are they going to put in it? Wet food, dry food, cold food, hot food, letters, right? <laughs> all kinds of things. Keys when you walk in the door. Lots of things can be put in it. And more import most importantly of all, in an age where no one ever has to use a handmade pot, why will they use it? That's the most important question of all. Why would someone want to use one of the objects that we make? This is a poem, and I wrote it down so I, because I can't remember it, by A. A. Milne, and it really describes what we do. Halfway down the stairs is the stair where I sit. There isn't any other stair quite like this. I'm not at the bottom, I'm not at the top. So this is the stair where I always stop. Halfway up the stairs isn't up and isn't down. It isn't in the nursery, it isn't in the town. And all sorts of funny thoughts run round my head. It isn't really anywhere. It's somewhere else instead. That's where we are. We're not really anywhere, we're somewhere else. We're in the place where the practical, the utilitarian, the social, the beautiful, the creative all come together. That's our stare, the, the special place where object and viewer interact. So let's recap. The viewer's role isn't passive. There is an implied invitation. The object is changed by this interaction. These take place within the context of life, right? So whenever you see these things, isn't that wonderful? I do like good hats. <laughs> these things occur in life. By the way, I love this painting, 18th century painting of a family with their prized tea set and they're each holding a tea bowl in a different way. Isn't that interesting? And they're holding in yet a different way and drinking out of it. So, this brings me to contempor the contemporary art world. We all know what 2D art is, right? 2D art is flat, 3D art is round. Increasingly, over the last couple of decades in art schools, we've talked about 4D art. 4D art involves time. It involves the sequencing, presentation, and documentation of interactions between artists, objects, actions, viewers, and locations. That's a definition of 4D art. Does all of that sound at all similar to something we've been talking about? <laughs> Commonplace forms of 4D art include installation art, performance art, video art, and interactive art. Now, interact, uh, um, performance art could look like this, right? <laughs> And this is also a kind of, you know, I missed an image. Oh, I've got a couple images are gone, so I'm just going to skip those. I'm going to go on to, but what I, what I had in those images are images of dinner parties because they are both installations and sometimes, as in this scene, they're getting ready to film a scene from Downton Abbey, they're performances, right? 
So, but I'm interested in that very last one that's come about over the last 15 years is interactive art. Interactive art is a form of art that involves the spectator in a way that allows the art to achieve its purpose. I'm going to read that again. That's the definition from Wikipedia. Interactive art is a form of art that involves the spectator in a way that allows the art to achieve its purpose. Which sort of sounds like this, right? Doesn't it? Or more likely, if we're really going to talk about art, this. So this is a, a formal ikebana by a, a, a ikebana artist named uh, Fume uh, Meiko uh, from Japan. So there's a collaboration and it all goes together. Or this is a painting of the tea ceremony from uh, 1775. Or this, just a Japanese dinner. Doesn't that look like both an installation and a performance and interactive? So, why am I bringing this up? Because if you read that definition for interactive art, in fact, if you read any of the many articles about 4D art and interactive art that now appear everywhere, we are never mentioned, right? Ceramics is never mentioned. The crafts are never mentioned. It's as if these ideas started in the 70s and never existed before in any other media. Now, Artists do love to do that, right? You know, performance artists like to think the theater never existed before they started doing performance art. It kind of goes with the territory. But the issue for that is this. Other people are defining our field. We're not doing it. Go read that definition of interactive art on Wikipedia and we're not there. And a big part of that is it's our fault because as long as I've been in ceramics, which is a long time now, we say it's functional or it's non-functional, and then we walk away. We haven't created the theories, we haven't enumerated the ideas, we haven't celebrated those qualities that I just talked about. We haven't tried to take them to the next level. We simply acknowledge that they are there, and now people from the art world are stepping in and they're doing the theories, and they're coming up with the ideas, and they're establishing the ways to judge quality, and we're on the outside. That's our stare, folks. <laughs> That's that special place that belongs to us, but it doesn't anymore. Because we never claimed it. As powerful as all of that is, we have intended to claim it. So. I have some recommendations for all of us. That's my invitation to this group today, to think about these things, to observe the way people live, to read the theory that's out there, to discuss this with each other, to theorize. Let's come up with a set of governing theories about this, to challenge our assumptions. Okay, that's the most important thing of all, because when we're talking about design, and we're going to make a bowl. We may be thinking about someone like this painting, The Bean Eaters, from 1560, that, uh, where the bowl sits on the table and you eat with a spoon. But the reality is we may be needing a bowl that you hold in your hand where you eat with chopsticks. Challenge assumptions. Not all bowls are the same. Not all pots are the same. So now, one last thought. I noticed over years of attending critiques, having been a professor and a teacher for many, many years, there were four things we talked about in critiques that virtually, in fact, just about every art publication I've ever read, you could take all the comments, you can boil them down to four categories, process and materials, composition and color, content, what does it mean? Precedence, who did it before? Who else is doing it now? And that's pretty much it. It pretty much covers it till I realized that when I talked to potters, that wasn't enough. I needed to also talk about interaction, right? How does the object and viewer interact? So that's my fifth category, and that's my recommendation to you today, and I'm going to end with this wonderful painting. Uh, it's supposed to be an allegory, and I don't understand it as an allegory. Um, this is by Antonio de Pereira. It's a kitchen scene 
from the Spanish Baroque. He lived in the 1600s. And it's just an amazing quality of objects beautifully painted, all put together in this kitchen. So I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Unless, if you want to run off to another thing, run out, go ahead. There's not another event in here for a few minutes, so I'd be happy to, we have a question. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, when you described our relationship to clay as artists and potters, you mentioned things like expression and exploration. Yes. Was, was there a, a specific reason that you did not specifically mention money or the motivation for the potter to make something, uh, sell it and accumulate wealth themselves? Well, no, I, that's, that is a, an assumption. People, throughout history, people have created objects in order to make a living, right? I, I mean, that goes without saying. And as someone who made my living as a potter for 12 years, I understand that you know, very clearly. Um, but that's a motivation to make a living. It's not a, necessarily a motivation to be creative or to be artistic because, you know, you can just crank out all kinds of stuff and make a living, right? So, but uh, how shall I say this delicately? Not many people become wealthy as ceramic artists. <laughs> is, that a, is that a clear understanding? Um, so when people choose to do this, the number one motivation is not money, right? Because we could take our talents and our brain power and make a whole lot more money selling insurance or, you know, being a lawyer or doing something else. So that's why. Other questions? Yes. Yes. That's a good one. So the question was, when I was giving Gombrich's list of changes that um, causes changes, you know, there were those three that I listed several times, and she asked, why not changes in technology? And I suppose that could fall under one of the others, but you're right, it could very definitely be a, a, a category all its own, because it is true all through history, people have responded to changes in technology. There's no question about that. Do I have any thoughts about the implications of that? Well, you know, I think all of this is a way of saying that we can I mean, we're at a time right now where people are remarkably open to change, where, where fashion changes very quickly, as opposed to previously when a change in fashion might take hundreds of years. Uh, where right now people are open to saying, sure, I'll change, right? And it's an, it's an invitation to us, an opportunity for us as artists, especially for artists who want to interact within life to do exactly that. Yeah, and certainly technology is going to affect the way we make the objects that we make, right? A lot of people are getting 3D printers and using SketchUp, and that goes without saying, right? Yeah. Question? Hi. First of all, I want to say this is a fabulous lecture. I'm just so pleased that you put all this work together. It's great. Thank you. But I do have a question about this, um, your last point, which is the interactive Interactive art, yes. Right, and exactly, my question is about the difference between everyday life and art, which seems to me always has a moment of intervention. And the when art I think, that always seems to be about what? Intervention. Oh, intervention, In sure. other words, when I think about performative art, as I've seen it, it's very much about taking reality and somehow reinventing it to be a very, um, somewhat commentary on the real. Yes. And I'm just, you know, I just was wondering if you'd like to it comment can, on It can this very painting, definitely be that. This that, painting is a good example in that that's not reality. No, it's not, but it's a reflection of that. But you're absolutely right. Art, though, was a reflection of life and, and in many ways a part of life up until the 20th century. 
And it was in the modern era, the early modern era, that the decision was made that art should somehow be separate from life. And that, uh, and it became most so probably just in the post-war era in the abstract expressionism when art was very definitely supposed to be for its own sake. We talked about art for art's sake, right? And it was, it was very pointedly not supposed to interact with life or be about life or even reference life. It was for its own sake. But what's happened since then is art has, artists wanted to talk about life, right? That's why postmodernists evolved with people wanting to talk about feminism and, and, and racism and the Vietnam War early on. And, um, and that's why content became such an important part. But what you're pointing, what you're putting your finger on is something I think that's very valid and very true that in some ways the last taboo and it is probably the very final taboo, because art doesn't even acknowledge that it has taboos. But in my opinion, the last taboo is in actually having art that takes part in life. Because uh, pottery can comment on life and be separate from it just every bit as much as other objects, right? All you have to do is look at Grace and Perry's work to know that that's the case. Um, but it doesn't have to. And I guess my point is, it's time for the last taboo, that last wall to come down and to acknowledge that art is not separate from life, that it's, it's a reflection of us, it's part of us, it's who we are as human beings, and we should welcome us, it back in among us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for coming. This has been great.